Chapter 5 of The Game of Life and How to Play It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Game of Life and How to Play It by Florence Scovel Shin. Chapter 5 The Law of Karma and the Law of Forgiveness. Man receives only that which he gives. The game of life is a game of boomerangs. Man's thoughts, deeds, and words return to him sooner or later, with astounding accuracy. This is the law of karma, which is Sanskrit for comeback. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For example, a friend told me this story of herself, illustrating the law. She said, i make all my karma on my aunt whatever i say to her some one says to me i am often irritable at home when one day said to my aunt who was talking to me during dinner no more talk i wish to eat in peace the following day i was lunching with a woman with whom i wished to make a great impression i was talking animatedly when she said no more talk i wish to eat in peace my friend is high in consciousness so her karma returns much more quickly than to one on the mental plane the more man knows the more he is responsible for and a person with a knowledge of spiritual law which he does not practice suffers greatly in consequence the fear of the lord law is the beginning of wisdom if we read the word lord law it will make many passages in the Bible much clearer. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord, law. It is the law which takes vengeance, not God. God sees man perfect, created in his own image, imagination, and given power and dominion. This is the perfect idea of man, registered in divine mind, awaiting man's recognition, for man can only be what he sees himself to be and only attain what he sees himself attaining nothing ever happens without an onlooker is an ancient saying man first sees his failure or success his joy or sorrow before it swings into visibility from the scenes set in his own imagination we have observed this in the mother picturing disease for her child or a woman seeing success for her husband jesus christ said and ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free so we see freedom from all unhappy conditions comes through knowledge a knowledge of spiritual law obedience precedes authority and the law obeys man when he obeys the law the law of electricity must be obeyed before it becomes man's servant when handled ignorantly it becomes man's deadly foe so with the laws of mind for example a woman with a strong personal will wished she owned a house which belonged to an acquaintance and she often made mental pictures of herself living in the house in the course of time the man died and she moved into the house several years afterwards coming into the knowledge of spiritual law she said to me do you think i had anything to do with that man's death i replied yes your desire was so strong everything made way for it but you paid your karmic debt your husband whom you loved devotedly died soon after and the house was a white elephant on your hands for many years the original owner however could not have been affected by her thoughts had he been positive in the truth nor her husband but they were both under karmic law the woman should have said feeling the great desire for the house infinite intelligence give me the right house equally as charming as this the house which is mine by divine right the divine selection would have given perfect satisfaction and brought good to all the divine pattern is the only safe pattern to work by desire is a tremendous force and must be directed in the right channels or chaos ensues in demonstrating the most important step is the first step to ask aright 
Man should always demand only that which is his by divine right. To go back to the illustration, had the woman taken this attitude, if this house, I desire, is mine, I cannot lose it. If it is not, give me its equivalent. The man might have decided to move out harmoniously, had it been the divine selection for her, or another house would have been substituted. Anything forced into manifestation through personal will is always ill-got and has ever bad success. Man is admonished, My will be done, not thine. And the curious thing is, man always gets just what he desires when he does relinquish all personal will, thereby enabling infinite intelligence to work through him. Stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord, law. For example, a woman came to me in great distress. Her daughter had determined to take a very hazardous trip, and the mother was filled with fear. She said she had used every argument, had pointed out the dangers to be encountered, had forbidden her to go, but the daughter became more and more rebellious and determined. I said to the mother, You are forcing your personal will upon your daughter, which you have no right to do, and your fear of the trip is only attracting it, for man attracts what he fears. I added, Let go and take your mental hands off, put it in God's hands, and use this statement. I put this situation in the hands of infinite love and wisdom. If this trip is the divine plan, I bless it and no longer resist. But if it is not divinely planned, I give thanks that it is now dissolved and dissipated. A day or two after that, her daughter said to her, Mother, I have given up the trip. And the situation returned to its native nothingness. It is learning to stand still which seems so difficult for man. I will deal more fully with this law in the chapter on non-resistance. I will give another example of sowing and reaping which came in the most curious way. A woman came to me saying she had received a counterfeit twenty-dollar bill given to her at the bank. She was much disturbed, for, she said, the people at the bank will never acknowledge their mistake. I replied, Let us analyze the situation and find out why you attracted it. She thought a few moments and exclaimed, I know it. I sent a friend a lot of stage money just for a joke. So the law had sent her some stage money, for it doesn't know anything about jokes. I said, now we will call on the law of forgiveness and neutralize the situation. Christianity is founded upon the law of forgiveness. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the karmic law, and the Christ within each man is his redeemer and salvation from all inharmonious conditions. So I said, Infinite Spirit, we call on the law of forgiveness and give thanks that she is under grace and not under law, and cannot lose this twenty dollars, which is hers, by divine right. Now, I said, go back to the bank and tell them, fearlessly, that it was given you there by mistake. She obeyed, and, to her surprise, they apologized and gave her another bill, treating her most courteously. So knowledge of the law gives man power to rub out his mistakes, Man cannot force the external to be what he is not. If he desires riches, he must be rich first in consciousness. For example, a woman came to me asking treatment for prosperity. She did not take much interest in her household affairs, and her home was in great disorder. I said to her, If you wish to be rich, you must be orderly. All men with great wealth are orderly and order is heaven's first law. I added, you will never become rich with a burnt match in the pincushion. She had a good sense of humor and commenced immediately putting her house in order. She rearranged furniture, straightened out her bureau drawers, cleaned rugs, and soon made a big financial demonstration, a gift from a relative. 
the woman herself became made over and keeps herself keyed up financially by being ever watchful of the external and expecting prosperity knowing god is her supply many people are in ignorance of the fact that gifts and things are investments and that hoarding and saving invariably lead to loss there is that scattereth and yet increaseth there is that withholdeth more than is meet but it tendeth to poverty for example i knew a man who wanted to buy a fur-lined overcoat he and his wife went to various shops but there was none he wanted he said they were all too cheap-looking at last he was shown one the salesman said was valued at a thousand dollars but which the manager would sell him for five hundred dollars as it was late in the season his financial possessions amounted to about seven hundred dollars the reasoning mind would have said you can't afford to spend nearly all you have on a coat but he was very intuitive and never reasoned he turned to his wife and said if i get this coat i'll make a ton of money so his wife consented weakly about a month later he received a ten thousand dollar commission the coat made him feel so rich it linked him with success and prosperity without the coat he would not have received the commission it was an investment paying large dividends if man ignores these leadings to spend or to give the same amount of money will go in an uninteresting or unhappy way for example a woman told me on thanksgiving day she informed her family that they could not afford a thanksgiving dinner she had the money but decided to save it a few days later someone entered her room and took from the bureau drawer the exact amount the dinner would have cost the law always stands back of the man who spends fearlessly with wisdom for example one of my students was shopping with her little nephew the child clamored for a toy which she told him she could not afford to buy she realized suddenly that she was seeking lack and not recognizing god as her supply so she bought the toy and on her way home picked up in the street the exact amount of money she had paid for it man's supply is inexhaustible and unfailing when fully trusted but faith or trust must precede the demonstration according to your faith be it unto you faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen for faith holds the vision steady and the adverse pictures are dissolved and dissipated and in due season we shall reap if we faint not jesus christ brought the good news the gospel that there was a higher law than the law of karma and that that law transcends the law of karma it is the law of grace or forgiveness it is the law which frees man from the law of cause and effect the law of consequence under grace not under law we are told that on this plane man reaps where he has not sown the gifts of god are simply poured out upon him all that the kingdom affords is his this continued state of bliss awaits the man who has overcome the race or world thought in the world thought there is tribulation but as jesus christ said be of good cheer i have overcome the world the world thought is that of sin sickness and death he saw their absolute unreality and said sickness and sorrow shall pass away and death itself the last enemy be overcome we now know from a scientific standpoint that death could be overcome by stamping the subconscious mind with the conviction of eternal youth and eternal life the subconscious being simply power without direction carries out orders without questioning working under the direction of the superconscious the christ or god within man the resurrection of the body would be accomplished 
man would no longer throw off his body in death. It would be transformed into the body electric, sung by Walt Whitman, for Christianity is founded upon the forgiveness of sins and an empty tomb. End of chapter 5. Recording by Amy Conger. Chapter 6 of The Game of Life and How to Play It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Game of Life and How to Play It by Florence Scovel Shin. Chapter 6 Casting the Burden, Impressing the Subconscious. When man knows his own powers and the workings of his mind, his great desire is to find an easy and quick way to impress the subconscious with good, for simply an intellectual knowledge of the truth will not bring results. In my own case, I have found the easiest way is in casting the burden. A metaphysician once explained it in this manner. He said, The only thing which gives anything weight in nature is the law of gravitation, and if a boulder could be taken high above the planet, there would be no weight in that boulder. And that is what Jesus Christ meant when he said, My yoke is easy and my burden is light. He had overcome the world vibration and functioned in the fourth dimensional realm, where there is only perfection, completion, life, and joy. He said, Come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We are also told in the 55th Psalm to cast thy burden upon the Lord. Many passages in the Bible state that the battle is God's, not man's, and that man is always to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. This indicates that the superconscious mind, or Christ within, is the department which fights man's battle and relieves him of his burdens. We see, therefore, that man violates law if he carries a burden, and a burden is an adverse thought or condition, and this thought or condition has its root in the subconscious. It seems almost impossible to make any headway directing the subconscious from the conscious or reasoning mind, as the reasoning mind, the intellect, is limited in its conceptions and filled with doubts and fears. How scientific is it, then, to cast the burden upon the superconscious mind, or Christ within, where it is made light or dissolved into its native nothingness? For example, a woman in urgent need of money may light upon the Christ within, the superconscious, with the statement, I cast this burden of lack on the Christ within, and I go free to have plenty. The belief in lack was her burden, and as she cast it upon the superconscious with its belief of plenty, an avalanche of supply was the result. We read, The Christ in you, the hope of glory. Another example. One of my students had been given a new piano, and there was no room in her studio for it until she had moved out the old one. She was in a state of perplexity. She wanted to keep the old piano, but knew of no place to send it. She became desperate, as the new piano was to be sent immediately. In fact, was on its way, with no place to put it. She said it came to her to repeat, I cast this burden on the Christ within, and I go free. A few minutes later, her phone rang, and a woman friend asked if she might rent her old piano and it was moved out, a few minutes before the new one arrived. I knew a woman whose burden was resentment. She said, I cast this burden of resentment on the Christ within, and I go free to be loving, harmonious, and happy. The Almighty Superconscious flooded the subconscious with love, and her whole life was changed, 
For years, resentment had held her in a state of torment and imprisoned her soul, the subconscious mind. The statement should be made over and over and over, sometimes for hours at a time, silently or audibly, with quietness but determination. I have often compared it to winding up a Victrola. We must wind ourselves up with spoken words. I have noticed in casting the burden, after a little while, one seems to see clearly. It is impossible to have clear vision while in the throes of carnal mind. Doubts and fear poison the mind and body, and imagination runs riot, attracting disaster and disease. In steadily repeating the affirmation, I cast this burden on the Christ within and go free, the vision clears, and with it a feeling of relief, and sooner or later comes the manifestation of good, be it health, happiness, or supply. One of my students once asked me to explain the darkness before the dawn. I referred in a preceding chapter to the fact that often, before the big demonstration, everything seems to go wrong, and deep depression clouds the consciousness. It means that out of the subconscious are rising the doubts and fears of the ages. These old derelicts of the subconscious rise to the surface, to be put out. It is then that man should clap his symbols, like Jehoshaphat, and give thanks that he is saved, even though he seems surrounded by the enemy, the situation of lack or disease. The student continued, How long must one remain in the dark? And I replied, Until one can see in the dark. And casting the burden enables one to see in the dark. In order to impress the subconscious, active faith is always essential. Faith without works is dead. In these chapters, I have endeavored to bring out this point. Jesus Christ showed active faith when he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground before he gave thanks for the loaves and the fishes. I will give another example showing how necessary this step is. In fact, active faith is the bridge over which man passes to his promised land. Through misunderstanding, a woman had been separated from her husband, whom she loved deeply. He refused all offers of reconciliation and would not communicate with her in any way. Coming into the knowledge of spiritual law, she denied the appearance of separation. She made this statement, There is no separation in divine mind. Therefore, I cannot be separated from the love and companionship which are mine by divine right. She showed active faith by arranging a place for him at the table every day, thereby impressing the subconscious with a picture of his return. Over a year passed, but she never wavered, and one day he walked in. The subconscious is often impressed through music. Music has a fourth-dimensional quality and releases the soul from imprisonment. It makes wonderful things seem possible and easy of accomplishment. I have a friend who uses her Victrola daily for this purpose. It puts her in perfect harmony and releases the imagination. Another woman often dances while making her affirmations. The rhythm and harmony of music and motion carry her words forth with tremendous power. The student must remember also not to despise the day of small things. Invariably, before a demonstration come signs of land. Before Columbus reached America, he saw birds and twigs which showed him land was near. So it is with a demonstration— but often the student mistakes it for the demonstration itself and is disappointed. For example, a woman had spoken the word for a set of dishes. Not long afterwards, a friend gave her a dish which was old and cracked. She came to me and said, Well, I asked for a set of dishes, and all I got was a cracked plate. I replied, 
the plate was only signs of land it shows your dishes are coming look upon it as birds and seaweed and not long afterwards the dishes came continually making believe impresses the subconscious if one makes believe he is rich and makes believe he is successful in due time he will reap children are always making believe and except ye be converted and become as little children ye shall not enter the kingdom of heaven for example i know of a woman who was very poor but no one could make her feel poor she earned a small amount of money from rich friends who constantly reminded her of her poverty and to be careful and saving regardless of their admonitions she would spend all her earnings on a hat or make someone a gift and be in a rapturous state of mind her thoughts were always centered on beautiful clothes and rings and things but without envying others she lived in the world of the wondrous and only riches seemed real to her before long she married a rich man and the rings and things became visible i do not know whether the man was the divine selection but opulence had to manifest in her life as she had imaged only opulence there is no peace or happiness for man until he has erased all fear from the subconscious fear is misdirected energy and must be redirected or transmuted into faith jesus christ said why are ye fearful o ye of little faith all things are possible to him that believeth i am asked so often by my students how can i get rid of fear i replied by walking up to the thing you are afraid of the lion takes its fierceness from your fear walk up to the lion and he will disappear run away and he runs after you i have shown in previous chapters how the lion of lack disappeared when the individual spent money fearlessly showing faith that god was his supply and therefore unfailing many of my students have come out of the bondage of poverty and are now bountifully supplied through losing all fear of letting money go out the subconscious is impressed with the truth that god is the giver and the gift therefore as one is one with the giver he is one with the gift a splendid statement is i now thank god the giver for god the gift man has so long separated himself from his good and his supply through thoughts of separation and lack that sometimes it takes dynamite to dislodge these false ideas from the subconscious and the dynamite is a big situation we see in the foregoing illustration how the individual was freed from his bondage by showing fearlessness man should watch himself hourly to detect if his motive for action is fear or faith choose ye this day whom we shall serve fear or faith perhaps one's fear is of personality then do not avoid the people feared be willing to meet them cheerfully and they will either prove golden links in the chain of one's good or disappear harmoniously from one's pathway perhaps one's fear is of disease or germs then one should be fearless and undisturbed in a germ-laden situation and he would be immune one can only contract germs while vibrating at the same rate as the germ and fear drags men down to the level of the germ of course the disease-laden germ is the product of carnal mind as all thought must objectify germs do not exist in the superconscious or divine mind therefore are the products of man's vain imagination in the twinkling of an eye man's release will come when he realizes there is no power in evil the material world will fade away and the fourth dimensional world the world of the wondrous will swing into manifestation and i saw a new heaven and a new earth and there shall be no more death neither sorrow nor crying neither shall there be any more pain 
for the former things are passed away. End of chapter 6 Recording by Amy Conger